thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's been a little bit different uh, the last seven or eight months, and I think if one thing's different is that the mayor and the city council have been working together as partners. If you like to see that, all right. And so we need to start the only way I know how. Let's introduce my partner, Councilman Andre Spivey. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we want to welcome Mr. Mayor and his entire cabinet, District 4, the best district in the city of Detroit. Uh, I think I said the best district in the city of Detroit, the best district. <laughs> So we want to welcome him here. There's some great things happening here, uh, and I'm glad that he appointed Odell Tate in Tucson tonight to be our district manager, assistant district manager, and we're glad to hear him tonight to be in our area. I know you have a lot of concerns. What I could not answer, he's here to answer. And so we'll get that done tonight, Mr. Mayor, on behalf of District 4. Thank you. Welcome, and uh, let's have a good time tonight. All right. Well, thank you. And I want to thank Father for hosting us. I told him uh, this is my second time here. Uh, my uh, father grew up on Three Mile Drive, a couple blocks this side of Mac. My grandmother lived there for 70 years, and I was baptized in this church in 1958. Uh, so I think this is my first time back, uh, and uh, father's going to check. Uh, right, I got to go back to confession. My first time back in this church. Uh, <laughs> Father's going to check the records and see if what my parents have told me is true and uh, if they've got my baptismal certificate. Uh, so I'm going to take some time and show you the things that we're doing. And then afterwards, I'm going to stay and answer every question for as long as you have. Some of you who are trapped behind the cameras might want to move because for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be showing you slides and I don't want you uh, to miss this. Uh, but let me just tell you, uh, a little bit about what we're doing. I'm going to start with the thing that's been in the news lately, the water department, all right? So let me tell you what's been going on. The problem we've heard is this. Nearly 50% of all customers are delinquent on their water bills. Each city is its own fund in the water system. So when Detroiters don't pay their bills, those bills have to be paid by other Detroiters. Suburbs don't pay, state doesn't pay, feds don't pay. So every time somebody in this city doesn't pay their bills, it gets put on everybody else here. And this year, your rates, if you own a house or rent a house and pay the water bill, your rates went up $80 this year just to pay for people who didn't pay last year. Okay? If they hadn't done something, by next year, it would have been up more than $100. Okay, so there was a problem. Well, how did we get the problem? I think you probably know the water department for years hasn't actually done much to collect the bills. Uh, for years, they would only do shutoffs on the people who had the oldest delinquencies and the largest amounts. And then they realized all they were doing was shutting off vacant houses, because those were the ones with the oldest delinquencies. So after a whole series of years of not collecting, uh, they decided uh, that they were going to send one written shutoff notice, and then uh, start turning off thousands of people. Now, my uh, colleague, Kevin Orr, I had been saying to him for a while, you might want to let me handle the water department. I don't think this is going to work. He said, don't worry, Mike, we got it covered. Uh, and so they started shutting people off. People started calling the telephone system, was totally overwhelmed. Doesn't even have an answering process that will send your call to the appropriate place. You went into the offices and the customer service lines were overwhelmed. If you couldn't afford to pay, there was no financial assistance uh, set up. It was uh, an embarrassment. And so Kevin Orr came to me and he said, okay, I think maybe I was wrong. And he said, you could have the water system. And he did that on July 29th. Uh, Alexis Wiley headed a, a team on our side. And here's what we did. We said, we're going to keep the moratorium in place till August 26th, and we're going to get this right. And so we added the hours at all the customer service centers and added Saturday hours because people who worked during the week couldn't get in to make the payment arrangements. We added telephone operators, put an actual professional telephone system in, allow people to pay over the phone, put in a clear payment plan that if you got an arrearage, you can put 10% of your arrearage down and pay it over the next two years. We thought that was pretty reasonable. But you got to make your payments. 
If you miss your payments, the next time you're going to have to put 30% down. And if you miss your payments again, you're going to have to put 50% down. So we'll work with you as long as you're making your payments. And we raised more than $2 million for people who genuinely couldn't pay their bills. And we're running a program just like the DTE Thaw program that helps people with home heating assistance. Uh, and so that is now in place. The other thing we did is this. Instead of just the postcard in the mail, we are actually go hanging door hangers on doors a week before the shutoff. So people have notice. You like that? One person liked that. <laughs> All right. We're finding out that more than half the people, when they get the door hanger, come in and pay their bills. We don't have to go through, turn their water off, turn it on. They get it done ahead of time. And so I won't tell you we've been perfect, but we've now got more than 25,000 residential customers on payment plans. Almost every business, we turned off every business in this town that wasn't paying. Uh, so, right, we had to do that, right? Every business is still in business is either paid up or on a payment plan, uh, and the shutoffs have been cut down dramatically. So that's what happened on water. Let's talk about the parks. Uh, you know what the parks have been like around here. Last year, 275 parks in the city, only 25 were maintained. You remember last summer how high the grass was? in a lot of these parks. To me, it was embarrassing. I was in a park when I was campaigning. Somebody had cut uh, one row of grass, and grass that high, so the kids could walk through the row to the swing set and swing, walk back out with grass up to their shoulders. What was that saying to our children? We said that's not going to happen again. So uh, with Gary Brown and the team from the General Services Department, Jan is here, they, we worked it. So this year, we're maintaining. 186 parks. Better, but not enough. All right? So then we went to the churches and the businesses, and they agreed to adopt 70 more parks. All right? And every 10 to 14 days, the parks in this city are being cut. Have you noticed a difference this summer? Okay? Something I'm pretty obsessed about. If I drive by a park, I make a call to GSD from my cell phone. They don't want to get that call, uh, but it's been happening less and less. So this is last year. The green dots were the only parks that were maintained. This are the parks we're maintaining this summer, and the red dots are what's been adopted. Do you see how much of a difference we've made for our families? And in District 6, the blue dots were the ones that were maintained last summer, and this is what we're doing District 4, this is what we're doing in District 4 this year. We're running 95% of our parks cut within 10 to 14 days. So we're going the right direction. And so we're taking parks that look like that, and they're starting to look like this. We're taking parks that look like that, they're starting to look like this. And so we're getting there. Balduck, anybody been in Balduck lately? Yeah. All right. So... This year, again, the team's done a great job. New walking trails, new picnic shelters, new playgrounds, dog park. Pretty soon we're going to have a soccer field. The UAW and Ford put in an absolutely beautiful baseball diamond, didn't they? And so if you haven't been there, this is what the playscape looks like. Picnic shelter, new comfort station, ball field. All right? And we've got plans in place to start to add playscapes and splash pads to parks on the east side by next summer. So we're going to show our kids they matter. So, and then Baldock Park, I don't know about this, but they adopt, they put in a zip line. So uh, fortunately, it's kind of close to the ground, but I don't know if that's the first zip line <laughs> in the uh, city of Detroit, but uh, the team here is pretty creative. Streetlights. District 4 is way ahead of most of the city in the new streetlights. Uh, we had the pilot area up near uh, Seven Mile and Gratiot that went first. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about what we're doing and why, because there's different expectations. I did um, uh, citizen forums before we did the pilot areas. But since then, I've been hearing calls from people saying, how come there's dark spots on my street? Uh, and it said to me, I haven't done a good enough job of going around and explaining it. So, where did the Public Lighting Authority come from? The state of Michigan passed a law. They took $12.5 million that we were using to pay for police in this town, 
and they gave it to the lighting authority. Because the theory was that if we lit this city better, we need less cops. So if we do the lighting right, that's a good investment. If we do the lighting wrong, we've lost money from police and it's even worse. We thought we were going to be able to borrow $160 million for new lights off that $12 million a year. It turned out uh, that Wall Street is gaining enough confidence in us. They recently loaned us $185 million. Okay? And it's allowing us to put in a lot more lights than we had originally planned. So here's what's going on. When I started in January, 88,000 light fixtures in this town, only half of them worked. So Otis Jones is here. Otis, stand up. He's the head of the lighting authority. He's the man putting in the lights. So. He worked for the Lighting Authority last year, and they spent most of the year fighting about should the lights be wired above ground or underground, should we start east or west, should they be LED, and in all of last year, they put up 500 lights. And here's the plan that they came up with. They were gonna use the old 75 watt sodium lights. In the neighborhoods, they were only gonna put lights on the corners, just at the intersection. No light at all in the middle of the block. That was a plan that was adopted, it was in place when I came in. If the block was really long, more than 600 feet, they'd put one light in the middle. There are 16,000 alley lights, and the city probably really shouldn't be lighting the alley lights, uh, but they uh, proposed to come in and take out all 16,000 alley lights immediately. That was a plan that was adopted uh, early this year, and they were going to be done by 2017. And as they debated this plan, they got 500 lights done. We came in, and with Councilman Spivey and the council members, we had put in a whole new lighting authority. And we came up with a different plan. I won't tell you it's a perfect plan, but I'll show you what we did. We said, instead of the old 75-watt bulbs, we're going to use 150-watt LED bulbs. They last almost three times as long. So the problems when a light burns out, nobody's there to replace it. It'll be years before they burn out. We're going to light to the national standards. And the national standards say that you have lights about every two to 300 feet. What that means is that you light not only the corners, but even on the short blocks, you have at least one light in the middle of the block. That's what they have in Atlanta, it's what they have in Seattle, it's what they have in Boston, it's what they have in Ferndale and Oak Park and Gross Point. That's the national standard. If the block is longer, you're going to put up two lights in the middle of the block. Again, lighting to the national standard. And on the alley lights, the alley lights are, are your backyards. I know in some places they're fenced off like they're your backyards, in other places they aren't, uh, but the city vacated the alleys by and large uh, 30 or 40 years ago. And so the old lighting authority said, we're going to take all the alley lights out. Otis Jones says, if the 16,000 lights are working already, why don't we leave them in as long as they're on? And so we decided to leave the alley lights in place, and we're going to have all the neighborhoods done by the end of next year. And people said, you can't do that. Never get it done on that schedule. And so we're going to get to the main roads by the end of 2016. We thought lighting the neighborhood uh, block should come first, lighting the main road should come second. That's the decision that we made. So here's, when I came in, we had 23,000 working lights on neighborhood streets. And of course, in some blocks, there were no lights working at all. The plan that was adopted before was going to go up to 30,000 lights. They were going to light all the corners. That was at least progress. The plan we are putting in right now is putting in 48,000 lights just in neighborhood streets, okay? This is the national standard. I told you we had 16,000 working alley lights. We're leaving the 16,000 in place until they burn out. And on the thoroughfares, the main roads, we're lighting them all the way up. Anybody been at Gratiot near Seven Mile and seen how the lights are? All right, you like that? Okay. And so. I want to talk a little bit about the national standard because I've had people say to me, there's dark spots on my street. I say, yes, there are. 
So the national standard and what every other city does is this. On your main streets, the grasses, the Grand Rivers, the Woodwards, with all this traffic, you light them all the way up. People are coming in and out of stores. People are crossing the street all the time. You have to light them up. In the neighborhoods, you put a light every two to 300 feet, basically every six to seven houses. That means there's going to be dark spots in the street. If you haven't done it, drive down tonight the streets of Ferndale or Gross Point or Warren because that's what happens in a neighborhood. You have enough light to see if a car is coming down the street without lights on or there's a group of people down there, but it's not intended to light up everybody's property. Street lights are spaced out in the middle of the block and the ends of the blocks. House lights are what you choose to do to light up your house. And so what we're doing in this city is lighting to the national standard for street lights, uh, and then everybody can make a decision how much you want to be lit on house lights. And if you haven't seen Gratiot, it's amazing. You can almost read a magazine there at 11 or 12 at night, can't you? Okay, that's how we're going to light the main thoroughfares. Uh, and, and so I think we're heading the right direction. So in January, the whole city, at least as far as new lights, was dark. Otis Jones, by August 26th, has put 18,000 lights in this city. Okay? Otis, stand up. He's putting up 1,000 a week. They said it wasn't possible. Okay? And what this map shows is if you're yellow, you're up in 48205, the lights are in. If you're green, they're being installed right now. And by January 1, almost all of District 4 in the neighborhoods, not the main streets, but in the neighborhoods, will be complete. So there may be times you think you're at the end of the line for getting some things. This is a time where District 4 was at the beginning. Trash, I got a chance to talk to one young lady who told me we haven't gotten her trash since the flood, but by and large, last few months, hasn't the trash collection gotten better? Okay. So you know what we're doing now, right? We're picking up the bulk every two weeks, right? It was a lot. Remember when it was once a quarter? Right? Okay. Yard waste picked up every two weeks. If you organize a neighborhood cleanup and you put the bulk out in front of the vacant lot, they will pick up the bulk from the front of the vacant lot. So Gary Brown and his team did that. So it makes it a lot easier for neighborhood cleanups to be effective. And we're going to expand curbside recycling uh, for those uh, who are ecologists. The flooding. Okay? Uh, if, if people have damage in their homes and they haven't filled out claim forms, we have them here. But I'm just being honest with you about the way it's going to work. If the damage was in your basement, I think there's very little chance the federal government is going to pay a claim. If the damage came in on the main floor, that's their definition of flooding. And so I don't want to discourage anybody to fill it out, but I also don't want to raise a lot of expectations. So what we have done on the trash side is this. We've fallen behind schedule. Uh, and so here's what happened. You've got, it's Rizzo on the east side of town, right? Out there. They got so backed up with some of the bulk being left out, we took our DPW crews and we put them out alongside them to try to speed it up. Uh, and if your uh, uh, bulk was out of the curb for multiple days because we were late, we didn't write anybody tickets for having it out. You'd have been really angry at me if we wrote you a ticket. Well, we didn't pick it up, right? Uh, uh, and we are back on schedule as of today, except for apparently one house that we're going to hit tomorrow. Uh, and, right? So uh, what street was that? Littlefield. Littlefield. So uh, Gary, we're going to be out at Littlefield tomorrow. Tucson's got the address. All right. So I don't know how you missed this. Buses. You guys are going to get used to me. I'm just going to tell you the truth, the good and the bad. On the buses, we have done a lousy job on the service. There is nothing I'm more frustrated with uh, than my uh, inability to fix the bus issue. If they're a lot safer, but they're not running on time. And so here's the story. We got 100,000 Detroiters ride our buses every day. We would have to put out 225 buses to do that. When I started, we put 143 out. You remember in January how long people stood out there waiting for a bus. We're better. We're up to 175 a day. But if you're actually following the schedule, it doesn't mean very much right now. Uh, and so what have we done? We've hired more drivers. 
We've hired more mechanics. We're fixing a lot more buses. But we have got buses that are so old and so decrepit that the greatest mechanics in the world can't keep them on the road. So we have an application in to the Obama administration for funding for 50 new buses. Vice President Joe Biden, I've talked to about the buses six times. When he comes to town, the first thing he says to me is, Mike, I'm working on your buses. <laughs> He's coming to town on Monday, and we're hanging out. Might even be hanging out in District 4, uh, I think you'll see, before the end of the day. He's been wonderful. He's all over this. The feds are going to make the bus awards by September 15th. If we get the 50 buses, by the end of the year, I believe we will be on schedule because the rest is there. But in the meantime, here's what, well, let me tell you what else we're going to do. I guess I didn't write it down. So here's what else we're doing. I've said to Dan Dirks and the folks at DDOT, we're going to try something different. November 1st, we're going to put out a new schedule. Except here's the difference. It's going to be an honest schedule. The schedule we print, we're actually going to make. Okay? We're going to tell you the truth. And we're going to put an app on your smartphone that if you're out at the corner and you wonder when the next bus is coming, you're going to be able to go on the phone and see the bus is coming down 7 Mile or Gratiot and will be at your stop in 15 or 20 minutes. Okay? They tell me it's been 20 years since DDOT actually adhered to the schedule, but the same technology that lets us tell you when it's coming also tells us what our on-time performance is. And as the Biden buses come in, as I'm calling them, we'll add more and more trips to the schedule, and we'll give you revised schedules. But I don't have anything, you're clapping now, I don't have anything good to say about uh, how I've done on the buses. Uh, it's, it's been my biggest embarrassment. I'm gonna stay with it till I get it fixed. The one good thing we did, however, is they're safer. We put cameras on the buses. We're well on the way to getting them installed on all the buses. We hired a full-time uh, transit police force, 35 officers, 27 on duty. I think 23 are on the buses and four in training. And so uh, these officers are there. The incidents that you've heard about drivers and passengers, think about it. We, we, we pay attention to what happens. But it's been a while since you've heard about an incident on the buses. So I don't have them running on time, but at least when you're on them, you're safer than you were. All right? EMS, we're getting there. Eight minutes is the national standard. When you dial 911, that EMS vehicle should be there in eight minutes. We're going to stay with it. We need 25 ambulances to make that standard for our volume. In December, we had 13 on the road. Today, we got 19 on the road. We're getting there, okay? And so uh, in, in December, it took 18 minutes. Last week, 12 minutes. 30 seconds. So, Fire Commissioner Edsel Jenkins, stand up. All right. And the Fire Commissioner and I are committed that by the end of the year, we're going to make the eight minute standard. Right, Edsel? All right. He's going to make it. So, here's what we got we got a new class of workers in the academy now. 15 new ambulances ordered, five of them are going to be on the street in the next couple of weeks. At the moment, we got more EMS workers than vehicles. We got 10 more coming in October. And so we are going to have those 25 vehicles on the street by the end of the year. We're going to make the national standards on EMS service, which is what the city deserves. Blight. Some of you are probably tired of listening to me talk about blight, uh, but I'm pretty obsessed about it. So how many have met? Odell Tate and Tucson Knight, our district managers. All right, they're doing pretty good. Uh, but you guys got a few here who don't have their hands up. Uh, so when I was in the campaign, I talked about we were going to start this Department of Neighborhoods. And in every neighborhood, we'd have a district manager and an assistant district manager, and they'd have one job. That's to fight blight. That's their only job. If you've got a problem with your taxes, you don't call them. Okay? That's not their job. But if... There's trash that's not getting picked up. There's an abandoned house. There's a tree falling over. Uh, there are vacant lots not cut. Their job is to fight blight. And, and if you have issues before the end of today, you can stand in line. Now, listen to you talk about your issues as long as you want. But if you've got a specific issue related to your house, if you talk to Odell or Tucson, they'll take care of your issue this week. So we have 100,000 vacant lots in the city of Detroit. 
had not been cut since 2010. We decided this summer we were going to cut them. Did you see us cut them the first time? Some of you did. All right. So we did. We have cut 100,000 lots first time. Two contractors hired more than 70 Detroiters. We are hiring people from our own community to go to work, improving our community. The first cut in District 4 is done. So in theory, they have hit every vacant lot in District 4. They do the front yards of the abandoned houses. They won't go into the backyards. Uh, and they hit the vacant lots. On September 22nd, they are going to be back again. And from September 22nd to October 14th, they're going to cut every vacant lot in District 4 a second time, so you won't be looking at it through the fall. If you happen to be in an area that by October 14th they haven't come back through, or if they missed you the first time, talk to Odell, talk to Tucson, and they will follow up. But overall, I think they've done a pretty good job of, uh, of getting through there. Part of the problems are that when you haven't cut the lots in four years, uh, there's a lot of stuff piled up in these lots, right? And so when Rizzo and Advance took over the garbage collection because it went private, we took 35 of our former uh, uh, sanitation workers and we put them on a new team where all they did was get trash and dumps off of lots in Detroit. Those 35 folks are out every single day. And so they have gone through a lot of these vacant lots because some, in some cases the contractor couldn't even get across the lot because of the dumping. They'd go through and clean that out. And so here's a lot that they worked on, and now it looks like that. And here's another lot that it now looks like that. This looks better in the daylight. Uh, and this was one of their lots which, when they finished, looked like that. That's what they've been doing all across the city. Six, seven hundred pounds of uh, debris. Is it pounds or tons? Sorry, Gary says I've slighted them. Six to seven hundred tons, thank you, Gary, of, uh, of debris being picked off the lots every week. We have doubled them up this last couple of weeks, picking up uh, the stuff from the flood, and we've gotten to every house but one. All right, so uh, with, if you have an illegal dump site, this is the team to do it. We're actually doing surveillance to catch dumpers now. Uh, and so uh, we're going to keep going. Demolition. Have you seen demolition going on in this area? OK, so I'm going to show you why some are saying yes and some are saying no. The original city process, 36 steps, took three to four years to complete. The city demolished 40 or 50 houses a week, maybe 200 a month. Okay, feds and states have given us $50 million, and the land bank has now taken over the demolition. I went and got Dave Minardo. How many people have seen all the construction that's going on at DMC, the heart hospital, the emergency rooms, et cetera? So Dave Minardo, Dave, stand up. Is Dave here? There's Dave, all right. So Dave headed up all of the construction at DMC. They did a fabulous job building a new children's building and the like. He and his whole team left DMC and they came to the city of Detroit. Best construction people I ever worked with. And so they're in charge of the demolitions. And so in 2013, they did 50 a week. In June, Dave got up to 90. This month, he's doing 250 demolitions a week. Okay? We've never seen anything like it. So if you've seen this, they'll come up and they'll post something that tells you this house is going to be demolished so you know the demolition crews are coming. If you see us post this on a house that you know shouldn't be demolished, please call the phone number before we knock it down. Uh, so we've got a better system. We haven't had that happen. Here's why some of you are saying I've seen it and some of you aren't. When the feds gave us the money, they said it can only be used in targeted areas. And the targeted areas in District 4 were Jefferson Chalmers, Morningside, and East English Village. Uh, you did a lot better than District 3, where there was no targeted areas. The feds will only let us demolish houses the land bank owns in those areas. I went to Washington, and I said, this isn't good enough. We got a lot more solid neighborhoods in this city. They said, all right, we'll let you double the size. You got to prove you can do it. And so now, 
If you can see the new green, uh, all of, we, we, were never be, we were never north of 94 before, but now we're north of 94 above the east side. And today, I was with the governor's staff in Lansing, uh, talking to them about supporting me in expanding these maps yet again so we can get to more and more of the city. But what does this mean? This is District 6. These are the demolitions. Okay, I'm having a bad night. This is District 4. These are the demolitions. We have knocked down since July 187 houses in District 4. Before the end of the year, we're going to knock down 291 more. What this map shows, if you can see it, are the green are the areas that are already down. They're down in Jefferson Chalmers, they're down in Morningside, a couple in East English Village. The red are where we're going. They're in the areas the feds just approved for us. And so we're going to be pushing up uh, even west of Morningside and up north of 94 on the east end. And so if you're in those areas, in the next couple of months, you're going to see a lot of houses coming down. And as soon as I get to this next phase, I'm going back to Washington, and we're going to just keep right on going. If you're not in those zones, uh, if there's been a fire, we have fire escrow funds. If the house was insured, we can knock it down. If it's an emergency situation where it's in danger of falling on somebody else, we've got a limited number of funds, uh, and we're just going to keep going on expanding. After we demolish, what happens to the vacant lots? We've seen this, right? They sit there forever and overgrow with weeds. We have a new process. We started about a week ago. And so we're going to sell the lot to the next door neighbor for $100. Okay? You can get it. You go on the website. How many people have been on our website, buildingdetroit.org? Okay? So we're selling the side lots. We're just starting now where we're demolishing. And so if you're the next door neighbor, we'll sell you, you gotta be current on your taxes. If you're not current on your taxes, I'm not gonna give you another property to be hiding your taxes on, right? And if you go on the website, it's pretty cool. It'll tell you on our website, if you're current on your taxes, if you wanna pay them, it'll give you the link so that you can go ahead and buy the property. It's gonna be first come, first serve. So if you and your neighbor uh, are both on the side of the vacant lot, whichever one of you fills it out first, gets the house. The only thing is that if two neighbors come in about the same time, if one of those neighbors has been keeping the lot up for the last few years, we're not going to give it to the other one because they were an hour ahead of them. So, so we have a little form there that says if you've been keeping it up, you can fill that in. But does that seem fair? Okay. So that's what we're going to do. And so when Dave knocks down a house, he now, at the time he knocks it down, he hangs this door hanger on the two houses next door and says, as soon as it's knocked down, you can buy it for $100. I don't want it to be vacant for a single day, right? I want somebody to fence it in, plant a garden, okay? And so that's what we're doing. Now, we have about another six or 7,000 vacant lots in District 4 that are owned by the city of Detroit. We can't sell them to you today because the city of Detroit hasn't moved them to the land bank so if you've ever tried to buy a vacant lot in Detroit, you have to go through a long process that culminates in an action of Detroit City Council, right? And so I'm hoping in the next two weeks, we're going to get these thousands of lots moved to the land bank, and then anybody here who's next to a vacant lot owned by the city will be able to go on the website and buy it for $100. We're counting on Councilman Andre Spivey to get that through for us. You're going to do that, aren't you? All right. So... So if in a couple of weeks you get a chance to buy a side lot, it'll be because of Councilman Spivey. All right? The lawsuits. Okay, this is what I spend a good part of my day on. We all know what's going on with these abandoned houses, and the strategy for years has been demolish, demolish, demolish. We got a lot of good houses that are vacant in this city, beautiful houses, right? Foreclosure crisis. It is not that the house doesn't have value. It's that people don't have confidence in the neighborhood. Who's going to buy an abandoned house, even if it's nice, if there's three other abandoned houses on the block? And so what did we do? We started filing lawsuits against every owner of every abandoned house in the neighborhood on the same day. So you know what was happening. So this is what happens. We will go down in the neighborhood and we'll post this. 
And it says, notice the owner, this vacant house is about to be seized uh, by the land bank. you got 72 hours. Come in, we'll make you a deal. If you'll sign a court order to get your house fixed up and occupied in the next six months, you keep it. Sign the order. I don't want the house. I want you to fix it up. But if you don't do that in 72 hours, we're going to sue you. Because you can't leave it there as a nuisance to your neighbor. Our partner on this has been Treasurer Ray Vojtovich and his deputy, David Shemansky. I saw David here earlier. Is he still here? All right. Well, you see Dave Shemansky. Tell him what a great job he's doing because he's, the treasurer has helped us. And so here's what we do. We sued in Mary Grove area first, East English Village second. We have now filed 569 lawsuits since May against owner of abandoned houses. 200 of them have already signed an order to fix up the houses. And so, one of the first places we went to was East English Village. These are the borders. Can you, can you actually see these dots? Let me tell you what's up here. So, there's 120 vacant houses in East English Village. You wouldn't know that. They do such an amazing job with Bill Barlage and that block club of keeping the houses up that you can't tell what's vacant and what's not. But if you leave houses in this city vacant long enough, the scrappers are going to get to them, right? Okay? So we went through and we filed suit in May against all of them. So these houses are all red. Can anybody see the color? That's good because I did a lot of work on this, these, these pictures. So I want to show you. This is the neighborhood today. And this is what we post in the land bank offices. If the lot is green, it means we sold the house on the auction. 32 have already been sold to new owners. 13 more are about to go on the auction site. If it's light green, it means we own the house and we're going to sell it in the future. If it's yellow, the owner signed a consent agreement. They're fixing it up, and we're making sure that they follow up. And if it's red, they're still in court with us. We haven't won. But if you, if you look how the whole map was red in May, now in August, most of the red's gone. Every week, it gets more green and more yellow. And if I come back here in three months, you're going to see we're going to convert this entire neighborhood. And the East English Village Neighborhood Association has just been phenomenal partners in holding open houses and getting bidders. We've sold houses in here for forty dollars and $50,000. It's been a really remarkable uh, process. And so you've seen this. If you've, been, if you've been in the area or driving the area, people are rehabbing houses all over the neighborhood. It's absolutely beautiful. So then we went to Jefferson Chalmers. Anybody here from Jefferson Chalmers? Okay. We got three of you. All right. So we came through about two weeks ago, and we started in Jefferson Chalmers in the area between Lakewood and Lenox as a place to start. And already, you see how those are red? You can see the vacant houses? Almost half of them we already have title to. We're getting ready to auction them. We're going to keep going until we're all the way there. And then in a couple of weeks, we're going to be in the Cornerstone neighborhood. Anybody here from Cornerstone? All right. So in a couple of weeks, uh, the, you will see that we will posters. Before the end of September, we're going to poster all the vacant houses. We've already got title to some of them, and they'll be auctioned as well. And so what we're doing is we're going through every one of the seven districts, and we're filing on a new neighborhood a week. So every seventh week, we'll come through District 4 and file on a new neighborhood. And so I know Morningside is in the mix. We may have some others who want to talk about this. But we're trying to start with the neighborhoods that are the strongest and then just keep working from there to fill them in and keep going. But this is how it's going, uh, and we've made significant progress. And so this is, if you haven't seen the website, this is it. It's buildingdetroit.org. It says neighbors wanted. You go on your listings. You can see the houses. Uh, bidding starts at $1,000, starts at 9 in the morning, 5 o'clock at night. Winning bidder has the house. Uh, and uh, they, have, uh, they have to put 10% down. They've got 60 or 90 days to close. And then they got six months to get it fixed up and get somebody moved in. So we're getting neighbors starting to move in. We've already sold 140 vacant houses. People said, who's going to buy a vacant house in Detroit? Since May, $2 million spent on houses that have been vacant for three or four years. 
we know our housing stock is great, and we're just going to keep doing this. And then uh, Chief Craig, I think, is uh, out tonight uh, on a project, but he and I have partnered on our latest thing. We're going after the drug houses. Every time a drug house is busted now, Chief Craig's team sends it over to the land bank. We send a notice out to the landlord. Your house has been busted for drugs. If it happens again, we're suing to take the house. And the second time, we're going to come in, seize the house, and sell it on the website. So if you see drug activity going on in a house, call your local precinct. They're doing the drug raids out of the precincts now. They'll go out and hit the house. And the second time, believe me, these cops, uh, they've been kicking down the same door in the same house four and five times, risking their lives each time. They're going to be very excited to go back in that second house and know that we're going to take it and get that drug house out of the neighborhood for good. One last thing, and then I'm going to take your questions. How many recognize this? All right. They put the sheds up to keep us out of Gross Point Park, right in the middle of Kirchival. If you haven't seen it, you're driving down Kirchival. I hope you have anything to drink, because they put sheds in the middle of the road. Uh, they said it was for a farmer's market. It just coincidentally was at the Detroit border. Uh, and so uh, there have been times in this city where we've marched and we've made noise, et cetera. I'm a different kind of person. I took our, our law department corporation counsel, Butch Hollowell, and he went over and said, we're going to sue you. Butch, stand up. <laughs> All right. We said, we're not going to beat you up in the paper. We're going to sue you because it's a danger to have a main commercial strip with sheds in the middle. <laughs> the people at Gross Point Park, interestingly enough, a lot of them were just as pissed off as we were. A lot of good people in Gross Point Park who did not like the message that this sent. And so if you didn't see it last week, we've signed an agreement. This November, they're taking down the sheds. The road's going to reopen, but I promised we would clean up the abandoned buildings on our side of the border, which I thought was a pretty reasonable thing to do. So we're going to get Kirchival reopened. We're going to clean up uh, the area along Alter Road, uh, and uh, hopefully this is the last time we see this kind of division. So that's what, uh, that's what, I, what I've been up to, and now I really want to hear what's on your mind, what you want to talk about, and I will say again, uh, Odell in Tucson, if you've got an issue with an abandoned house or a dump site or something that Odell in Tucson can take care of, why don't you guys stand up? You can talk to them, and they will take care of it. If you want to tell me about it, come up to the microphone, because I want to hear, because that's why I came out. Uh, so I'll leave it to you. Um, Chris B. Greer, um, Pastor Assistant at Spirit of Love Baptist Church. Um, I had a quick question. I said it, you said that you made a comment saying at the two drug bus you will seize the house. Right. Um, now, would that be the same protocol for an apartment or how? Would well, uh, that's an interesting question. And so uh, if it were one apartment unit, it would certainly be a problem for them. Uh, so here's the problem is if the landlord is on notice and they don't act, we can take it. But most people don't deal out of a house they own. Most people are, are renting or squatting. And so the landlord genuinely doesn't know. And so the courts would say it's not fair the first time to take the house. We haven't tried it uh, on an apartment unit. But if you've got a place where they're repeatedly dealing out of the same units, um, why don't you talk to Odell or Tucson? We'll coordinate with Chief Craig. But if we can get multiple raids out of the same place, we could do that. I haven't done it on an apartment building yet, but you could be the president. All right. All right. Hey, how you doing, everybody? Good. Um, I'm just a homeowner, and um, I just want to say I'm proud of the way that the uh, trash has been being picked up lately, and also the lights on grass shit is awesome. Yeah, aren't they great? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're going to get all the grass shit done that way. Hi, I'm Marsha Woods, and I'm a resident adjacent to Balduck Park. And I think, first of all, I want to say thank you for all the improvements that have gone in there. It's awesome. But we continue to have, I guess I would have to say, safety concerns, right. uh, especially on weekends. We get a lot of cars driving into the park. It was never designed for cars to be driven into it. Um, we get a lot of loud music. Yeah. Um, and we get a lot of traffic that creates safety issues for the children that love that playscape and that zip right, line. Right, right. Um, 
parking becomes a real bad issue. When both sides are parked up, you've got a one-way street with traffic right. going two ways. So, so is anybody here from the Detroit Police Department? Uh, so I, I would say this. What we have seen this summer in a lot of our parks is a huge increase in the usage in neighborhood parks. People have felt unwelcome on Belle Isle. Uh, and they have poured into many of the neighborhood parks. In the case of Balduck, you had more attractions this year than you had before. Uh, and I gotta tell you, I have been so impressed that we have not had a major incident. The Detroit police have done a good job in the parks, but it sounds like we need to step it up on Balduck. So uh, let's make it a point, Butch, if we can, uh, to get uh, the chief uh, engaged on this, and we'll see if we can't step it up uh, a little bit more. But thank you for letting us know that. Hello, Mr. Mayor. My uh, name is Carl Stahl. I live in Cornerstone on Radnor Street. And uh, I've got a couple questions for you. Uh, one, you mentioned on the uh, getting the houses tore down that are fire damaged right. and have an escrow account. Right. I have a house across the street from me. I've been uh, in contact with Mr. Spivey. For two years, this escrow account's been sitting there. And for two years, I look at this house. Right, hang on. I'm going to introduce you to the man in charge of fire escrow accounts, Brian Farkas. Brian, how come you can't get this house down? <laughs> Do, are you aware of this particular house? Okay. My, my second thing is the lighting. Um, I had a light at the end of my driveway. Well, let me back up. There are three occupied homes on my block. All the rest are vacant. They moved the light right. from where it was 60 feet right. into a tree. Right. And it lights up nothing. Right. I called the lighting department. They told me, don't worry about it. That's the way it is. That's the way it's going to be. I said, it's ludicrous. You should have left the light where it was. Like I said, it's the only... It's right between the houses that are occupied. I know. Is there anything we can do about that? So I'm going to let Otis talk in a second, but let me say this to you. Uh, I, I know this sounds irrational, uh, but this is a situation we have. We are lighting this city to the national standard, which is the corner in the middle of the block. We've got some people whose house is two or three doors from the end of the block and happen to have a working light. And when you put it in the middle of the block, you move it down, and they talk just like you do. And, and I understand why you'd like to have it in front of your house, but if you're planning the city for the future, and I hope someday we fill in those houses, you're trying to do it in a uniform way. Having said that, we have a rule that if you are moving the light into a tree, you don't put it there. You put it on one side, or the other. And Otis is going to tell me what he's going to do about yours. Uh, absolutely. Um, we do have the ability to move that light, and we should have considered the tree being there. Is Dana here? Dana, I need you to get his contact information. Uh, and, sir, uh, we will go back and look at it. My name is Laverne Holman Williams, and this is Kevin, Kevin Williams. Um, we're from the Yorkshire Woods community, and I haven't heard Yorkshire Woods mentioned, and we're bleeding, and seriously, from the rats, the vacant houses, and we're just wondering when we can see relief, because we've had to actually extend our fence upwards because the weed trees that were here are now over 10 feet tall. And we're dealing with, um, we're in a corner house, we're dealing with rats, we're dealing with a ton of blight, houses on three corners now are vacant, and uh, we just need some relief. I've heard um, about um, East English Village, Morningside, and we actually moved from Morningside just to stay into, in the city, but uh, it's a struggle. It's a struggle, and we're just and, uh, wondering. We actually did uh, some things that you were talking about. Our home was empty for two years. When I first saw it, the door was standing wide open. Uh, we, we bought it, we, we got a very good price on it, brick home, um, and we did all the upgrading that needed to be done. But at the same time, there are houses around us that since that point in time have done nothing but decay. And as my wife said, we've heard a lot about blight money that's been going 
to other parts of the city. I haven't seen any houses torn down over right, here. Right. Uh, and we're, we're wondering when that might happen. Right. And so this is the way I'm always going to be, is I'm going to be honest with you about what you can expect uh, and what you can't expect. We have 50,000 vacant houses in this city. We're taking down 250 a week. Assuming the federal and state money keeps flowing, which is no given, I'm working on it every day, it'll take us four to five years to get through the city. And so the feds are allowing us to go through area by area as opposed to spreading it across uh, everywhere. And we got to talk to Odell about when your area might be. What we are doing is for everybody in the city, we're getting lights on, we're getting the garbage cleaned up, uh, we're getting the ambulances to show up, et cetera. But as far as the blight goes, it's going to be a four or five year process, and everybody wants to be have theirs done now. And if I live next to an abandoned house, I understand. Uh, but we're going to get there as soon as we can. And I don't know if Odell has any more idea on a timeline uh, than that. We, um, already constructed Why don't you use the microphone? You got that? We've already constructed this past summer and worked with um, Michelle and with um, Mose Prim on several cleanups in your area. And we're looking at um, probably some demolition might be coming for you before the year is out. But we don't know quite yet. We have put some of your houses on the list, but I'll be coming to your next meeting and give you an update. Are, are they in the, the new? Uh, no. No, not in the hardest hit zones yet. Yeah, so until the feds extend the, dead, the borders, uh, we'll be able to do fires and emergency ones, but that's going to that's gonna be probably all we have for a while. Actually, one was a fire. Okay. There was a fire Actually, there. there's two. Okay, so if there is fire insurance money, we can get to it right away. So, Brian, Brian, raise your hand again. If you've got a burned house, there is fire insurance money if the house had insurance. And, and that money is in a fund, and we can get to it. Hey. Hello, Mr. Hi. Mayor. How are you? Hi, good. Congratulations on your position, and we're glad you're here. Okay. You're doing a great Thank job. You. I, right. you are. My name is Sharon Sklar, and I'm actually the neighbors here, and um, I'm also a resident of Balduck Park. And um, one of my biggest concerns is the last three weeks, we're so happy that it looks so nice and it's so coiffed and manicured, but it's three weeks of nightmare with yeah. uh, music that you can hear in your home with your air conditioning running, traffic, people openly drinking in cars, yeah. having I sex on the street it's it's a nightmare okay. it's horrible uh, and well, the police response is not acceptable so all. i'm going to call chief craig on my way home tonight and we're going to talk about it and see if we can't get some presents during labor day weekend how's that we have um, you know the cars like they said in the park and then we also have another problem with people coming from out of the city with keeping their dogs off the leashes and now we have all these children that are at the park and i actually called myself on there was a pit bull off a leash with the owner and a German shepherd and another large dog and I did call and the police drove by and did nothing. Do, do we have a neighborhood police officer in Balduck? Uh, officer King? And so I'll call Chief Craig, you call Officer King and we'll see if we can't uh, get some response. Okay. And also um, I did want to say something else about um, uh, the suits for the owners of the homes that they're letting you know go what do you do when the people live out of the country like we have a house where the owners in Australia right. what do you so so our obligation is to send a the lawsuit to the address of the owner record post it on the door of the house and publish it in the newspaper and if they haven't responded in 28 days the court uh, says you haven't responded and they deed it to us. So we have not had a problem uh, with people being absentees. The judge doesn't have any tolerance. If you don't even notice there's something posted on your door for 28 days, the judge doesn't have any sympathy for you. I was born in this city in 1967 and I've lived here in, in this northeast neighborhood my entire life. And I've watched it really. And I'm now starting to feel like maybe it's going to come back. And 14 years ago I bought an historic property on the corner of Cadu and East Warren, an old oh, farmhouse. Okay. Has an acre and a half of land, most of which borders wow. the alley uh, the, parallel to East Warren. In a year's time, I can have 
1,400 square foot of someone's house dumped there over a period right. of a year. Right. Everything from mattresses to carpeting, busted tile. Right. I've got to have a, at least eight yards of crushed concrete that's been dumped over there in the last 14 years that I don't know what to even do with. And Is, is like, it there now? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll get DPW out to get it. So talk to Odell. We'll get DPW out to get it. Well, there's been continuing dumping. Uh, three weeks ago, I had a lot of friends from the neighborhood, from the East Side Soccer League to the Cadu Cafe, the friends of the Elder Theaters, about 30, 40 people that day to help clean up. And three days later, there was three and a half yards of concrete dumped so, right at the end of so my driveway. So again, I'm going to say this to you again. <laughs> talk to Odell, and we'll get it, because what we now have is a police surveillance unit that's well, dedicated to this. Well, you you saw that. them get the five people who were doing the graffiti. They just arrested somebody who was illegal to, illegally turning water back on when it was shut off. And they will do surveillance on spots that are frequent dumping sites. Hello, my name is Tracy Perry. I'm the uh, president of the East Side Unity Association. And my neighbors and I, we've been coming together and we've been uh, fighting the blight. We've Good for you. Cutting grass, boarding up homes. Uh, we have a, we've even been dealing with graffiti, and that's my concern tonight. Uh, graffiti is out of control in our area. It sure it's is. constantly increasing. Um, we had to recently deal with the situation that I want to know your perspective on. Uh, there are uh, organizations that want to paint on the vacant properties in the city, and uh, recently we had voiced our opinion to this organization that we didn't want. Are these the ones on Kelly Road? Yes, sir. Okay, so I told Dave Bernardo to knock them down before they paid on them. Okay. All right? And I, I appreciate that, but I, what I want to do is educate myself. I want to understand, and we want to understand, the, the particulars on this, because we were told to, do, uh, to get petitions signed stating that a vast number of residents don't want painting on the vacant properties or yeah. objects brought to the object. Yeah, again, houses. anybody who goes on a vacant property and paints is trespassing. Unless they've got the permission of the owner, they could potentially be arrested. But I'm aware of your situation, no. and we've dealt with it. We're speeding up the demolition. We're not going to allow it, but we're speeding up the demolition, which is the reason, uh, you know, the, the kids don't want to look at vacant houses across from Denby High School. I understand that. So we're speeding up the demolition of those houses so they don't feel like they have to pay. It's really nice to see you. We hosted a house party for you um, back when you first um, began. Well, thank running. you. I hope you're happy about that. We're very happy. All James right. Ribron is my cousin. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I remember. Yeah. It was um, a very nice day. Thank you. Um, just wanted to ask, once the demolition sign is placed on a home, how long do you have to wait before it's going to be torn down? Uh, you know, normally it's two or three weeks, depending on when the, the feds uh, gave us the approval to go to that area. But if you talk to Palencia in the pink over there, she can probably give you a pretty good idea when it's coming. And this is in regards to uh, sound levels. Um, I looked up, we, ha we have a few parted houses in our neighborhood that just uh, get so out of hand noise-wise. I went to the city charter and looked up the rules and the regulation on noise levels. And the only thing that's posted there is uh, specifications about um, muffler noise, uh, cars with, w with loud mufflers. And there's no specifications on just uh, private streets. Now, I do forensic work for the uh, police department here, the courts, and I've got three open murder cases I'm working on right now. But what I'm saying is that we need to have something in there that explains what the maximum level is for party noise, um, just so you can get okay. some peace and quiet. We, we could look at an ordinance, Butch, but like, we need to get you to the neighborhood police officer because there is a disturbing the peace ordinance. Uh, and and a, a neighborhood police officer who knocks on the door and deals with them firmly, in most cases, will solve the problem. So, Odell, let's make sure we get him hooked up with the neighborhood, or Tucson, get him hooked up with the neighborhood police officer. Let's see if that works. And if you want to talk to Butch Hollowell afterwards about an ordinance, I know he'd love to have your thoughts. So I'm going to, did the way we do this feel good? All right. Thank you all very much for your questions, and I'll be back again uh, in a few months.